we will see you face to face and shout your praise. We'll shout your praise. You make believe from the ashes. Breaking through the darkness. For everything that's broken. In you is made whole. Beauty from the ashes. Good morning, church. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Praise God. If you're a guest with us, my name is Kelly. I serve as senior pastor. It's a high privilege to do so. Glad you're here. Hope you feel quickly at home. Let me begin with some of Matthew's account of the events 2,000 years ago. In the Gospel of Matthew, we read, The angel said to the woman, women rather, Jennifer, do we have that slide? I wanted them to, there you go. The angel said to the women, and so they're at the tomb early on resurrection morning, do not be afraid. Now I highlight this because the same words spoken to those women, the morning of resurrection, the Lord would say that to us. Think about last week. Think about the stuff you're facing. This is a good word for us still. Do not be afraid for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. So just as the good word, he's risen, I'm sorry, just as the good word, do not be afraid, applies to us this morning. The go tell applies to us as well. We're here this morning because we want to tell people about the good news of the gospel of Christ's resurrection. We'll do that through song together. We'll sing and then... I'll get up and do my best at it in preaching. Now, Easter is special in the life of the church. It's that day set aside to celebrate the historic morning, right? So Christ was physically bodily raised, and it happened on a particular morning uh, 2,000 years ago. But the realities of the resurrection are new for us, are, are true for us every morning, those who are trusting in Christ, not just one morning a year. They're they're true for us every day of the year. So while we're excited to draw special attention to the resurrection of Christ on this particular day, what actually often makes this day unique in the life of the church is that people often return to church on Easter morning after having been away from the church for a long time. Or people come to church for the first time in order to check out the claims of Christ. Welcome, if that's you. In fact, I want to offer a special welcome because it's special to us that you would be here and completely understandable that you'd show up on Easter morning. But I want to offer a special welcome that captures the living hope that's found through faith in Jesus. It's on the screen. To all who are weary and in need of rest. To all who mourn and long for comfort. To all who fail and desire strength. And to all who sin and want a savior, welcome. This church throws open wide her doors in the name of Jesus Christ, friend of sinners. Would you stand with me while I start us off in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope provided us daily because of Jesus' resurrection. We thank you for the rest, comfort, strength, and forgiveness we find through Jesus Christ. And we ask that we would all feel welcomed in his name this morning. 
Finally, Father, would you open our minds and hearts to believe more deeply, and would you open our mouths now as we sing to proclaim boldly the good news of Jesus' resurrection. For his glory and our good, amen. Let's sing. Morning, church. Are y'all ready? Come on. And I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty brains, treasures that fade, never enough. Then you came along. Oh
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Is welcome home, the sinner now a saint. The God who died came back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah! Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah! Christ is risen from the grave. Death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of Kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours. Oh, praise His name forever. I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. The tears of joy, I lift my voice, and everlasting praise. Hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, dead, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of Kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed, eternal life is up, oh praise His name forever, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the Church. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Not for us, for him. Because the stone was rolled away. Amen. Woo. Imagine walking up and not seeing Jesus in the grave, right? Yeah, we'd be elated, right? The evidence right there in front of our face. Come on, man. It's almost as if the team that you were hoping to win the tournament wins the tournament. What would your reaction be? Yeah. Right? Woo. You'd be like, yes! I won the bracket. This is exponentially more than that. 
This is child's play. That's child's play compared to the Savior, compared to the grave being empty. Can I get an amen? Amen. And then we're going to sing a song called Resurrecting. And believe me when I say we're going to sing a song called Resurrecting. Crowned with glory now, the Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at His feet we bow. The one who bore our sin and shame. Soldiers watched in vain. Was 
was borrowed for three days His body there could not remain Our God has robbed yes. us Amen. Father, we praise you, Lord. We praise you for sending your son, Jesus. We praise you that the stone was rolled away, that the grave was empty, and Jesus was resurrected. But sin was not resurrected with him. It was left in the grave, and we are forgiven in him. We have new life in him. And just as we, as we just sang, we are resurrected as well in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, before you have a seat, turn to somebody and say good morning. Matt? Yeah, there I am. Matt and Brooke met in college. Matt was the outgoing football star with plans to own a sporting goods store one day. Brooke was a shy elementary education major who came to life any time a child was nearby. In the fall of Matt's senior year, he rushed out of the gymnasium one afternoon and collided with Brooke. She was only a sophomore, but her books and her papers, as they went scattering around, their eyes met, and they married the following summer, 10 months later. As with many young couples, the first years were stressed. Money was tight. Matt worked long hours in his new management position. Brooke worked hard to quickly finish school. And she landed a good job shortly after graduating. Her first years as a teacher were filled with late nights, but they were rewarding. Life was busy, but there was always lots of joy in their marriage. It was the joy they shared together that led them to consider starting a family. They felt the gravity of making such a decision and took all the appropriate steps. 
they talked with their parents and their friends and about the decision, and everyone seemed supportive, and eager to enter into their joy. Of course, there are always unknowns when starting a family. Brooke wanted to go to part-time as a teacher, but would the school allow her to job share? If not, could they live on Matt's salary alone? There were lots of questions, but there was also lots of excitement. It didn't take long. They got pregnant after only a few months. Matt was the first to tell others. He was bursting at the seams. He shouted, he danced as if he just made the winning touchdown at a football game. He grabbed her, he swung her around in circles. He waved his arms, pure delight. They giggled together. After about a week of excitement, though, the reality of the responsibility covered Matt like a heavy blanket. Brooke found him one day on the back steps to their home, head in hands, his face flushed with every fear, and he went on to share those fears with Brooke. He felt as though he knew nothing about parenting or what it would take to give the child a good life. He wanted the child to have every advantage. He wanted the child to be smarter than he was. He wanted the child to be kinder, more considerate, less angry, more in control of his life. He wanted his child to experience all the good things, not to suffer with the same faults or face the same difficulties that Matt had suffered from or faced. Brooke kept her emotions intact as she heard her husband's little rant Tears spilled from the corner of her eyes. She smiled. She loved Matt and had every confidence that he would be a great father. With gentle whispers, she reassured him. As Brooke's stomach grew, so did Matt's playbook. He kept a notebook of dreams and tips for parenting. He read books. He pestered his friends, his parents for advice. He searched for the best music teachers, the best gymnastics classes, the best preschools. Brooke snickered, convinced that this was the way Matt copes with life. Even with all his planning, nothing prepared him for the day. The nurse laid his newborn son in his arms. All the excitement for that future fell quiet and silent as he gazed into the eyes of his child. He kissed his wife. He kissed his son. Together, they named him Brett. Matt and Brooke had become parents. It's a beautiful story. Young marrieds starting a family is a story with which we're all familiar. We love that type of story, right? Children and coming into families. We love children and families at Glowham Bible Church. In fact, I'll take this opportunity to welcome our elementary age kids with us here in worship. Special privilege to have them. One of the things I love about Easter is families worshiping together. Today's sermon could be titled, What to Expect When God is Expecting. Did you know that God is pregnant? That is to say, God is giving new birth to folks all over the globe, adding to the number of those who are a part of the family of God, a family which he started and he cares for. Have you seen the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting? 28 years ago, it was all the rage when Sherry and I wanted to start a family. We bought the copy. In fact, as I looked for this little graphic, uh, you could see different iterations of the cover on Google as you're searching images. This one claims 17 million copies sold just a few years prior to this. Only 10 million copies. Today's question for us is, what to expect when God is expecting? What to expect when God is expecting? When God is growing his family? When God is bringing people to new birth through faith in Christ? The Apostle Peter, in his first letter, writes some of the details to this reality in the opening chapter of his letter. It's on the screen. Let me read it to us. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he begins, it's an opening to a letter. Praise. In his great mercy, he has given us 
new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that it's through that resurrection that he's providing us with life. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is bringing folks to new life, giving folks new birth. He goes on, and into an inheritance. Those who are joining the family of God into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by their own strength. No, shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. And all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, these trials have come to prove the genuineness of your faith. So you have not seen him and nobody in this room has seen him. Right? It's Resurrection Sunday, um, 2,000 years later. Peter writes in the 60s, and I don't mean the 1960s, just 30 years after Christ's resurrection. He says, though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Again, Peter penned this little letter 60 years after Christ's resurrection. And he wrote the words of this letter to encourage believers who were facing various trials. Now, what's fascinating is how he goes about offering them encouragement. He does it by reminding them of their new birth. All my kids are grown up. But for many years, as a part of the annual birthday celebration, when they were younger, we'd retell their birthing experience. They didn't remember it, of course. We'd get out the baby book, find a place comfortable to sit together and rehearse the details. Admittedly, Sherry was better at this than me. But we rehearse the details surrounding their birth experience. This provides great comfort and even, I think, a sense of place in the family and hope for our kids. That's what Peter's doing. If you've been born again, if you've experienced new birth, which is to say that you're trusting in Christ's death for the forgiveness of sin and his resurrection for eternal life, then you have, according to Peter, living hope. Even when facing difficulties, you have real power. Again, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. God brought you to new life. We didn't bring ourselves to new life. God brought us to new life, which means God means, means God's empowering us. Look what Paul wrote in the second letter he wrote to Pastor Timothy. He has saved us. We are not saving ourselves, in other words. He has saved us. He's called and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purposes and grace. Just like, just like the little story I opened with, Matt and Brooke deciding to have a baby apart from any knowledge of their future child's character, whether good character or bad character, God gave new birth to us apart from anything we have done, are doing, or will do. You see, salvation is about God primarily. Yes, it involves us. But it's it's primarily about His purposes in His grace. It's a blessing to us, but it's for his glory and our joy. Do we see the hope that this provides? The real and living hope. Folks, if I am my 
greatest hope. I'm in real trouble. But if God is doing something according to his purposes and grace, if God is bringing me to new life, then I have real power, real living hope. Do we see the hope? I hope we do, because when we realize that we did nothing to earn our salvation, then we don't worry about losing it. So many of us ride the roller coaster of, well, I'm going through difficulties, hard times, I guess God doesn't love me anymore. Peter writes to these Christians suffering trials and he begins with their birth story. He gave you new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's reminding them this work of salvation doesn't start with you, continue with you, or finish with you. It's God's work of salvation. When we realize that living hope we begin to bask in the love of God and we find comfort that we're shielded by God's power, not our own power. This is such good news. Sometimes I think the the pulpits of the church preach so-so news or pretty good news. This This is tremendous news. It's truly good news. So much so that Paul the Apostle wrote in Romans 8, if God is for us, who will be against us? If this is what's going on, who will be against us? I'll read it for us. Follow if you would. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So many followers of Christ memorized verse 28 there, that first verse I just read, and they never continue on. For those God foreknew, he foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He determined it. He destined it that he might be the firstborn. He's talking about Jesus's resurrection among the brothers and sisters and will be the secondborn and the thirdborn. And a tremendous uh, family of God being brought in through new birth. And those he predestined, he called. And those he, he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And glorification is the, uh, is the end result. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is doing this, if God is for us, who will be against us? No one. Amen. Notice who is saving whom. Paul wrote that it's God who predestined us. It's God who called us. It's God who justifies. It's God who glorifies. We are not saving ourselves. God's saving us through new birth. How ludicrous would it have been if in my little story about Matt and Brooke, the newlyweds, wanting to start a family, if Matt and Brooke had paused after expressing the desire to start a family and just waited, expecting their future son to do it on his own. Right? That'd be ludicrous. It's just as crazy to think that we can give new birth to ourselves. We can't give spiritual new birth to ourselves any more than we can give biological birth to ourselves. New birth is something God's doing. In fact, this reality highlights the complexity. It highlights the complexity of offering moral education within the church and the home. Parents, listen closely. This reality that God's giving birth, bringing people to life through faith in Christ, highlights the complexity of offering moral education within the church and in our homes. If we're not careful, when we call our kids to obedience to Christ, what many hear is, be good enough to be saved. Behave so God will like you. That is not the gospel. That's not the gospel. 
The gospel is not about God making bad people better behaved. The gospel is about God bringing dead people, the resurrection, to new life through faith in the firstborn among us, that is Christ. Teaching people to be good is not the primary role of the church. In fact, it's a hellish distraction. If we're not careful, we will raise pews full of people who are well-behaved and destined for hell. The role of the church is to proclaim you must be born again. Not that you should be born again or it'd be a really good idea if you were born again. You must be born again. This was Jesus' exact phrase to Nicodemus. John chapter 3, read it later today. And if you're unfamiliar with the story of Nicodemus, let me describe who he was to you. He was a tremendous suburbanite. He was well-educated, highly credentialed, and deeply religious and moral. Yet when nose-to-nose with Nicodemus under the cover of darkness, and Nicodemus is speaking with Jesus, too too scared to come to Jesus in the daylight, Jesus says to this highly moral, he was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, which is to say he had memorized what is the first five books of our Bible, the Torah, memorized. And most of the Psalms he would have had memorized. This man was committed to righteousness, that is, living rightly, doing what's appropriate. Jesus didn't say to him, hey, you cleared this hurdle, now you got to get over this hurdle. He didn't say that to him, folks. He said, you must be born again. And it confounded Nicodemus. He wasn't sure what it was all about. Never forget someone new to the church 18 years ago now asking me, why does everyone keep talking about being born again around here? When I asked her why it bothered her, she explained that the phrase born again had a negative connotation for her. It was used by her family to refer to a bunch of self-righteous, Bible-thumping, judgmental people. And it made me sad to hear her family's experience of some Christians as judgmental. But as I shared John chapter 3 with her, Jesus' confrontation with Nicodemus, she was actually comforted to learn that it was Jesus' words. It wasn't just something that the church had thought up. The self-righteous, judgmental people she had, her family had experienced, but they were actually Jesus' words. That new birth has to happen through faith in the resurrection. And that that's something God's doing. Several days later, she wrote me an email. A portion of that email is on the screen. I find it fascinating. It wasn't until you showed me the passage in the Bible where Jesus tells Nicodemus that he must be born again that I really did some soul searching and realized that born again actually applied to me. No one in this room remembers their biological birth. She wasn't aware that she'd even been born again yet. I'll get to that in a moment. It scared me for a while to identify with the statement, but I am really a different person now. I can't remember the moment that it occurred, as everyone else seemed to feel that most born-agains do. And some of us will remember that day. But I know that I've been born again. I can feel and often hear the Holy Spirit in my life. So what are we to make of this? What should we expect since God is expecting? 
And I want to take you through a little graph. I offer the graph just clarity as kindness. This is my best attempt to be kind. And it helps me to think this way. When Jesus, it is, it's my deep, deep conviction that when Jesus offers the metaphor of being born again, that he does so as the most brilliant teacher that's ever walked the face of the earth. The same man who says you must be born again gave us the ethic of turn the other cheek. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He's unparalleled in his ethical teaching. And he's the same one who told us, you must be born again. So we've got to wrestle with that, folks. I would go so far, let me just be as transparent as possible, that um, I believe God designed the biological birthing process so that Jesus could talk about spiritual new birth. Let's give God a little credit. Let's assume that an all-knowing, all-powerful being of the universe could actually order the unfolding of history so as to communicate clearly to us how he's at work. So when Jesus says you must be born again, when Ezekiel says dead bones are going to be are going to rise, let's give God a little credit. What should we expect? Let's begin with the parents' decision. All right? Because we understand that biologically. In the same way, it is God who first makes a decision. So in Romans 8, it's God who foreknew, I'm going to start a family. It's God who predestined. He selected some. In 1 Peter, and I didn't read those portions, but it's in verses 1 and 2, the word election is used. He chose. That word is also used in 1 Peter chapter 1. He chose. So God determines, according to his purposes and grace, he's going to build a family. Just like Matt and Brooke said, hey, we want to start a family. Next is conception. We understand conception physically. It is that moment when, um, well, it's either fertilization or implantation. It's when new life happens in the womb. It's that point at which there's finally life in the womb. I'm trying to be appropriately generic. We have elementary kids in the room. The same happens spiritually. Theologians call it regeneration. It's that moment when new life comes. When God does something that only God can do and he brings dead people to life. He opens the tomb and out comes the Savior who's firstborn among all creation. So salvation, biblically, if you read the narrative in the New Testament, it's punctiliar. It happens in a moment when we're justified, when we're brought to life, regenerate, but then it's also a process, all right? It's ongoing, it's unfolding. Paul talked about those whom God is saving. So there's election, regeneration. I'm going to skip drawing for a moment. What Paul said, those he called. I'm going to skip that. I'll come back to it. The end result. This is the first point at which man voices, humanity voices something. It's that moment in the birthing process of delivery um, when the doctor slaps the baby's butt and the baby cries out loud, right? The, the baby gives voice as a living creature outside the womb. That's what conversion in mankind's physical response to the new life that's come. Paul writes in Romans 10, if you, do, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's not enough simply to believe in your heart. But to also profess with your mouth so that when we're here from, and, and someone's working on the platform at Glowing Bible Church, we say very clearly, if faith in your heart is rising up and you find in your heart a desire to believe, then let your mouth profess what your heart's believing and you'll be saved. For it's with the heart that you believe and are justified. It's with the mouth that you profess and are saved. It's Romans 10, 9 and 10. 
Now, between regeneration and conversion is something that is often called drawing or calling. Jesus said, unless the Father draws you, no man can come to me. These are Jesus' words. I'm not making this stuff up. This is Christ, our Savior. Arguably, the greatest ethicist to ever walk the earth. No one comes to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws them. So what might this be? This might be that strange period in our lives when we have unexplained desires to go to church when we never wanted to go to church before or to read our Bible when we never before wanted to read the Bible or we grow tired of a sin a sin which we've cultivated and clung to for many years and we now finally realizing that sin is bringing me death that's the drawing of God it's that strange season when we start asking our friends, so what do you believe about eternity? We may go to the Google and say, what is there after death? No, it is. I mean, y'all giggle. I know the Google, right? But the internet is ripe for drawing. People are going there and asking. They're asking all types of faith-based questions. Drawings that time of spiritual seeking as one's been drawn to the Father through faith. So, this morning, remember I started the service by saying, Easter is great because it's a time when many people return to the church after being gone a long time. Or people come for the first time to the church wondering about the claims of Christ. Or maybe you were polite enough to come with family this morning. There was a season in my life when I was just polite or well-behaved enough that my mom would drag me to church and I would listen in. But if you feel faith rising up, if you have a strange, unexplained interest, if you have a desire to confess with your mouth faith that you feel rising up, God's at work in your life. God's at work in your life. Now, the primary objection to being to born again theology, the primary objection is not actually hypocritical Christians, although there's plenty of that to go around. The primary objection to born again theology is that we're not in control. God, it's God who's pregnant. It's God who's giving new life. Every other religion in the world says that you're in control. Every, every other religion in the world says that you are in control. If you want eternal life, you've got to run faster, jump higher, morally speaking. You've got to demonstrate your value and worth. Only Christianity says salvation is something God's doing. Despite our sinfulness, he sent his son to suffer and die on our behalf and then be raised. Only Christianity says salvation is something God's doing. That we're actually not in control. It involves us, but I don't cause it, nor do I maintain it. Therein lies living hope. Because if I cause my salvation, if, if I maintain my salvation, folks, I'm in a world of trouble. If I'm my greatest hope, my family's in a world of trouble. But if it's Christ in me, to quote Paul, the hope of glory, then praise God. So I get it, we want control. Our flesh craves control. Until in those more honest moments, we realize how out of control all things are to us. When we remember our behavior of yesterday or this past week, and we realize that we're deeply selfish and self-sabotaging. So in those moments where we're particularly honest finally with ourselves, then there, there may be a glimpse of, I'm okay with God being in control. And if you're having that, then rest assured, you can have living hope through Christ. For God has done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. While we were still sinners, he sent Christ to die for us and be raised to newness of life. And you can be born again right now 
by letting your mouth profess what your heart is believing, you'll be saved. This morning, don't let the human desire to pretend we're in control prevent you from having your deepest human need met through God's hope in Christ. If you're not ready to do that, we're still eager for you to be here. Because we believe God's drawing people. The gestation period of my second child, I don't know the exact days, it was 11 days longer than it should have been. It was miserable for me. (laughs) Some people gestate longer than others is the point. Are you following me? It takes longer for God to draw some than others. It takes longer for God to call some than others. And we welcome you. I started with a, with a welcome, the deepest of welcomes here that I could offer. If you're weary and tired and failing and feel weak, welcome. Welcome by Christ, the friend of sinners. You're, we love it that you'd be here and asking questions like, why does everybody keep talking about being born again? We welcome that. In fact, we welcome it because Jesus did. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, ask, seek, knock. In other words, if you're here this morning investigating the claims of Christ, but you're not yet ready to be converted, that is to let your mouth speak, proclaim it, then our encouragement is keep asking, keep knocking. The door will be open. Everyone who asks, seeks and knocks, the door's open. Everyone. That's Jesus' words. So based on the authority of Christ, we welcome you here. We're eager you're here. Can I pray for us? Father, I pray that you'd fill us with living hope, that you'd have mercy on us as a people, that our desire for control would not undermine our need for new birth. I pray we'd stop thinking that our moral perfection qualifies us for something and we would bask in your unconditional love and favor in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing about our living hope. Just one. That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down. Thank you.
with the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me It's a, uh, it's a blessing to hear you sing with such passion. We invite you all into Rathbun for some donuts and coffee afterwards. Our benediction for today, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and hope, encourage your hearts this morning and strengthen you for every good word and deed. The Lord's blessings on each of you. in you only and my